say, well, that's just the way it's going to be. Not if we get to praying, it ain't. <laughs> Woo! I'm looking for, Brother Pete, I'm looking for a move of the Holy Ghost. I'm seeing, I'm seeing, and I know this is about to go on the internet, so I'm going to try not to call anybody's name or nothing, but I'm seeing some folks in here on Sunday mornings that their, their entire life and entire body is, is, is wrapped up in conviction. They want it so bad, but they need something to just propel them, and they, they don't understand that that's the Holy Ghost got a hold of their heart, and it's pulling, and it's pulling, and it's knocking, and it's, and it's crying out, I want to help you, I want to bless you, I want to deliver you, I want to save you. And the thing that's going to get past people's inhibitions and get past people's fears is when the people of God begin to pray and we have a sovereign move of the Holy Ghost. Oh, you listen to me right now. I'm talking about when the Holy Ghost moves and the kids come out and you don't even notice. Say, well, that's just natural. I'm telling you that that's uh, any distraction to a move of the Holy Ghost is not of God. I'm talking about the, the kids ain't never going to stop being kids. Never. You don't want them to. You don't want them babies to, to have to act like they're grown up when they're seven. My goodness, nobody wanted you to act that way. If you did, I feel sorry for you. But I got to be a kid. And every one of them ought to be a kid. But we, when, the, when the Holy Ghost begins to move like I'm talking about... Sister, Sister Manning and Sister uh, Nadine were talking at the at the funeral the other day about how to, how they didn't know how in the world Sister Kesley picked Chunky Monkey up and began to dance around with her <clears throat> little Ava. Her name left me for just a minute, <laughs> not the Chunky, but the name. <laughs> I'm talking about you can uh, there. There is nothing that can stop a sovereign move of God in a praying church. But we got to learn. We got to learn how to pray. You know, and some will say, well, I know how to pray. Well, part of my job, part of my job is to listen when folks pray. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's some of us don't really know how to pray. We got some of us got a five-minute prayer that we repeat 12 times to get through an hour. This, this prayer pattern, I'm telling you from experience, you start praying this prayer, prayer pattern, you have no problem praying an hour and probably go over and never even realize it. We got to learn to pray with a destination in mind. I, look, look here. Look here, man, I, I really didn't like when people said this when I was a little kid, but I've been around this a day or two, Sister Sherry. I, I've been around this a day or two. I'm 43 years old, Brother Pete, this is all I know. I don't remember when Mom and Daddy didn't come to church. So all, all of my life that I know about, we've been here. Or somewhere like here. Look here. All hell's broke loose in your life. Uh, let me just pull something out of the air. Uh, you know, you got a 15-year-old son that you fin found out been smoking pot since he was 12. And you didn't even know. You just all of a sudden found out that uh, your great Aunt Lucy has been diagnosed with uh, stage 4 lung cancer. Get your light bill in the mail, and it's two and a half times what it was last month. We're talking, we're running the gamut. Some things are life or death. Some things are just upset you and scare you to death, and some things are just life. But but be honest with yourself right now. Think about this. How many times can you say, "Lord, deliver my baby from smoking pot"? going to say it like 10,000 times in a row? You understand what I'm saying? There's just so many ways that you can say, Lord, heal great Aunt Lucy of cancer. 
So, in order to make up for what we really don't know to do, here's what we do. God save great Aunt Lucy. If we, if we get real emotional, then it matters more. Okay? I've seen this happen before. Okay? Brother Terry says, Brother Marcus needs prayer. And Brother Billy says, I know Brother Terry's done turned in prayer for Brother Marcus, but he's really sick. I've heard it. I've heard it many times. Okay? I've heard it many times. And I appreciate what's happening. But we've got school to think if it's a bigger emergency, then we'll pray harder. Okay, but what I'm telling you tonight is if you, if you begin to pray consistently, you're always there. You're always there in the presence of the Lord. Because we ain't going to pray no harder. Okay? Because it's just... I feel this bouncing back at me, but I'm telling you, when you get into a lifestyle of prayer, a continual, habitual, moving into the presence of the Lord all the time, and somebody says, Great Aunt Lucy has got lung cancer. Immediately, you're there. Because you don't have to go to repenting. And you don't have to go to fixing all your problems. And you don't have to, to realize, I'm about to ask the Lord for something, but yesterday I acted like a fool. Say, well, that ain't no big deal. Oh, let me tell you what it is. You think the devil won't use that? You think the devil won't come dragging your mess up in the, and say, uh, did you, was you about to pray? You remember this? But when you get into consistent, specific, habitual prayer that ends up in the presence of the Lord, you don't have to deal with that. Come on now, you can't tell me that you ain't started to pray for somebody in some kind of an emergency and automatically everything you've ever done wrong in your life started flashing in your mind. Huh? Huh? And then before you know it, well, I ain't even. I better call somebody else. Mine ain't gonna work. I'm a heathen. Are you feeling me? The Lord, the Lord didn't make no bigger deal out of blind eyes, leprosy, or, or a servant's, or a centurion sick servant than he did calling Lazarus out of the tomb. It was just the way it was going to be. Lazarus, come forth. See, Gehazi, I mean, uh, Naaman, Naaman had that same kind of attitude. When he came with leprosy, leprosy's a big deal, Brother Billy, and he's kind of a big deal, so the prophet's got to make a big deal. Somebody that's tuned into God... The centurion, what did he say? You just say the word. My servant's going to be healed. If you say the word. The Lord said, I ain't never seen that great of faith. But you go on home and uh, by the way, he's going to be healed. Then he gets home. Finds out what time he was healed, Brother David. Guess what time it was? Right when the Lord spoke the word. Say, so, alright, well that was Jesus. I was hoping somebody would say that. Because Jesus said, the things that I do, you shall do, and greater. The things I've done, you're going to do, and greater, because I go to my Father. 
I can tell you, I've read a whole lot of books. I've read about Brother Foss. I've read about Brother Cook. I've read about Bug and Nona Freeman. I've read about all of them. And the one thing that ties them all together is they was praying people. I preached a message here a while back. I looked at my notes again. I first spoke about it, Brother David, Brother Johnny, and others at our at our Christmas party two years ago. I'm feeling it right now because I'm thinking he's preaching on prayer. Oh my goodness. You know, I've been knowing God is great since I was in the first grade. Come on now. I know how to pray. I know how to pray. If we really knew how to pray, we wouldn't feel the need to be dramatic. We just pray. Because it's the same. Remember, even when Jairus' daughter, they, they hired some folks to come in and caterwaul and cause a whole bunch of ruckus. And when the Lord showed up and said, hey, she's not dead, she's just sleeping, the crier started laughing. They mocked Jesus to scorn. You know what he did? Kicked them out. I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time to play games. I ain't got time for, for overblown dramatics. I got a miracle to get to heal. I do it. Talitha Kumai, that's what he said to her. Arise. And uh, the Bible says straightway she arose. That's from being locked in. That's from being tapped in. That's from recognizing what the mission is. I lost my train of thought on what I was saying, but it'll come back in the middle of this, so just hang on. Anytime that we set out toward a destination, we got to have a map or a pattern. We got to be led in a specific direction. There's a tried and true pattern that is set before us that works. Because, see, the plan is to reach the presence of the Lord at the Holy of Holies. See, the tabernacle had to be set up. I want you to understand this. I'm speaking from experience. There's going to be times when your flesh says, I'm tired of doing that. There's going to be times when your flesh says, I'm bored with that. I want to do something different. We're talking 40 years. Brother David, every stop, they had to set the tabernacle up. And it had to be set up the same way. The same... Man, I would really like to rearrange this furniture. I would really like the, the shoe bread to be first. And, you know, it really doesn't matter. And put the light over on this side. And it'll make the, you know, every time. It had to be set up in a specific order every time. The priority was protecting the order. And the sanctity of the tabernacle. Because when they did it like the Lord said, they manifested obedience to God. To understand this, caring for the tabernacle was delegated to the tribe of Levi. They were to be caretakers of the tabernacle itself and over all the vessels of the tabernacle and over all the things that belonged to it. They were to take it down and put it up and any stranger that came and tried to meddle in it was immediately killed. The organization was their responsibility and it must be kept in order for the whole thing to work. Because if you look, and I encourage you, go home tonight, and instead of getting on Facebook, go to Google or one of those search engines and type in the tabernacle. And you'll see all kinds of pictures. There are some places, Brother David, it's really cool. They set up a real tabernacle, and you can find them. Uh, I really want to learn how to do that stuff Brother David does with the clicker and all because I found some today, but I, I couldn't quite get, get it. I actually just didn't have a clue in the world what I was doing. But uh, that's a story for another time. But they had to be, it, it wasn't just the tabernacle, Brother David, that had to be set up in the same place. But every tribe had their position all around it. The Lord is into organization. The Lord operates and honors effort and organization. That's why the praise team's got to practice. That's why the sign team's got to practice. That's why the preacher has got to study. That's why we've got to do things decent and in order. No 
room for being bored. There's no room for breaking up the monotony. But things must be consistently done in obedience to God in order to get to this place you want to get to. Their ability to hear from God. To have their sins forgiven. To have any type of relationship with God with God was predicated upon the tabernacle and the furniture being set up exactly like God wanted it. The glory, the glory would not bless a haphazard, unorganized assembling of the sanctuary of God. For the first time, God had a place, a house here on earth. For the first time, there was a meeting place between man and God. Where it was divinely ordained that if you want to meet me here, or if you want to meet me, here is where we'll meet. In observing the earthly tabernacle plan, we, we can truly become a living tabernacle as the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be. The church is the body of Christ. And we must live a life that is divinely ordered in order to be divinely approved. The Old Testament plan can be manifested in our lives. Now here we go. The responsibility for you having a relationship with God is upon your shoulders, not mine. The responsibility for you having a relationship with God is to be upon your shoulders. It ultimately boils down to you and how hungry are you for a move of God. Do we just want to be religious? Are we content with just a few goosebumps and, you know, somebody getting the Holy Ghost every now and again and somebody getting baptized every now and again? Or are we wanting a, a, a mighty, powerful, divine revival from God where people begin to come in here off the streets and where you invite people to come or you pray people through to the Holy Ghost in the grocery store or in Walmart or on the job? It can happen. But it doesn't happen accidentally. God does not want us to be in prayer like the proverbial blind squirrel looking for an acorn. But he wants us to be a hungry child seeking plainly for the presence of God. No more aimlessly wandering about having a move of the Holy Ghost, having a, having a shout down, having a, a powerful wave of the Holy Ghost every now and again. No more is it going to be spotty here and there and, and there be half the church that don't even know what's going on. But heading to the Holy of Holies every time. Encountering with God Almighty every time. The prayer pattern is a perfect pattern for everyone to pray and it will establish you as a man or woman of God. You will have a relationship with God that you've never had before. It's a pattern that fits everyone. It begins with the gate. The entrance is the gate. And as the psalmist said, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. When we approach the Lord, we approach him with praise and thanksgiving. We will cover every one of these individually, maybe cover two in a week, but we will cover these. This is just a highlight of them. But we, as we're praying, this is, I know there was some that said last time I taught this, they didn't quite understand what I was saying. If you could picture the tabernacle set up, a, a, a enclosed structure, uh, uh, probably a little bit larger than this church, but, but an enclosed structure with a curtain of skins all the way around it. And there's a, there's a gate for people to walk in, in the front of it. Uh, and it is, so when you pray, the tabernacle is, is a meeting place of God. It is a, a type of Jesus Christ. It is a type of heaven. It is a type of the temple. It is, it is the plan that God gave for when they wanted to meet with him. And when you and I go to pray, that's what we're wanting to do. So the first thing we do is we step through the gate. Can I get an amen? Amen. And I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I approach the Lord. I'm getting ready to start. I'm beginning my prayer journey into the Holy of Holies at the mercy seat. I'm going to meet the Lord. And I begin with thank you, Jesus. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. It's anticipation. 
got to understand something. We've got to get to the place. We're not, you're not trying to work nothing up. You're not trying to, oh, Jesus. Come on, if you can't tell me you ain't prayed like that before, I have. Today I knelt to pray. I got started with, I'll enter your gates with thanksgiving. I want to say thank you, Jesus. Bring, 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 bring. Phone ringing. Entrance is the gate. So you walk through the gate and the very first person piece of furniture you will see is the altar it's the altar it's the place of slaughter it's the place of sacrifice it's where you repent and die out to the flesh you're going to find out that it's the biggest piece of furniture in the tabernacle because the biggest war you and I have to fight is the one with our own flesh the next is the laver of water it's a beautiful, beautiful illustration of the cleansing power of the Word of God and the ability to see ourselves in the Word of God as the, as the laver was made out of the looking glasses, the mirrors of the ladies. And he could bend over and look at himself in it as he's washed. The next is the five pillars that separate the outer court from the inner court or from the outer court from the holy place. And those five pillars represent the five, uh, uh, the five uh, uh, qualities or five uh, name-like qualities of, of Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 9 and 6. Unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called <laughs> Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You pray that. The next is the golden candlestick, the menorah. And I'll tell you what I'll try to do, fellas, if y'all help me, is I took a picture of the menorah that has been made for the new temple when I was in Israel, and we'll have it. A solid, one solid piece of gold made into a single menorah candlestick. It's the light, it's revelation, it's truth, it's the power of the Holy Ghost. The next is a table of shoe bread, which is the word of God. Eat the word of God. The next is a golden altar of incense. It's where we offer up prayer and worship and our petitions. That's when you get to give your prayer request. But I, I, I got to honestly tell you that I hope one of the missions of this is to get us away from our prayer being all about our request. golden altar of incense then we've got to go through the veil got to pass through the veil which symbolizes our flesh and getting past our own thoughts and our own feelings of inadequacy and then finally into the holy of holies where sets the ark of the covenant within which are the ten commandments a pot of manna and Aaron's rod that buds but you got to understand this, and I'm coming to a close. I'm coming to a close a little bit early because we're going to take a few minutes and pray. I'd be a fool to teach on prayer and to speak of the importance of prayer and then just dismiss us to go get a soda pop and a chili dog or whatever. Ain't nobody got any chili dogs cooked up, do they, by the way? I'm trying to lose some weight. Y'all quit y'all stop y'all stop encouraging me. No one, no one accidentally, irreverently, haphazardly ends up in the Holy of Holies. priest did it he was dead 
So what we're talking about doing is not just something like that we're going to show up and say, you know what, I, I think, I think, my goodness, man, you know, I got the dishes done early and the kids ain't really bothering me too much. Man, let's just, let's just pray and see what happens. Uh, now, we've all had those moments in our lives. Where the Holy Ghost quickens us and you think, well, I, I mean, I, I got like five minutes here. I could pray. Here you go. Here you go. How many of you ever picked your kids up from school before? When you're sitting in line and got to pull up, guess what? You have like seven minutes to get a hold of the Lord or something like that. But I'm telling you that you can do this. You can do this anytime. The DVDs I have of it, Brother Mangan tells about he and his wife driving from Alexandria to Baton Rouge. And they pray through the tabernacle in the car together. The Holy Ghost ends up filling up the car, Brother Chris. And before you know it, they're both weeping and crying and talking in tongues as they enter into the presence of the Lord together. Let me tell you, you just think what it will do for your marriage, you and your wife or you and your husband pray through together. Hello? We're talking about a change. It's going to take effort. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take purpose, being purposeful. But I'm going to take you through every step. I'm going to give you, I thought, did somebody steal my pamphlet? Yeah, I got a new one. I, I got a new one. I was going to show it to you. I've only got one, but I ordered a hundred. There's plenty to go around. I'm really disappointed they weren't here today either. Matter of fact, I started to just put it off a week. But I'm going to take you through every step. Thing is, Brother Pete, I can't put it off a week. Since some cases, some of us in our lives have already given the devil too much of a foothold. You got to get him out. Gone. Get out of my mind. Get out of my home. Get out of my heart. Get out of my family. You done let him. You done let him. Mm, my God. I could really have throw down tonight. But you're not going to haphazardly meander into the presence of the Lord and then find yourself in the Holy of Holies and be like, well, how did I get here? But you're going to begin to pray with purpose. We're going to have 12 hours of prayer, probably in the middle of this, and then when it's done, I'm going to encourage each of you. We're going to begin to move away from operating in the natural to operating in the supernatural. And you're going to be amazed at what begins to happen in your life when you allow your faith to kick in. There's some things that need to be dealt with from an honest heart. Stand with me. Please. I'm going to encourage you when you